Its appearance may be bright and welcoming, but its history is dark and shameful. This wall near Eight Mile in Wyoming was designed to keep people apart. It was built to separate the white from the black. But today, the concrete structure provides a backdrop for Burdette Rochelle's garden. He has lived with the wall for decades. He knows its past, but accepts it as part of the present. It didn't bother me one way or the other. I didn't care. Yeah, but I like the wall. So if neighbors can embrace this symbol of racial division, does that mean race relations are improving? Or in Southeast Michigan, have we just become comfortable with segregation? Many Detroiters take for granted that there are white neighborhoods and there are black neighborhoods, and that those are natural, that that's just the way things always have been. Professor Thomas Sugru has researched and written books on race in his hometown of Detroit. He calls the city a symbol of urban crisis. The most important factor shaping segregation in metropolitan Detroit was uh, persistent segregation in the housing market. In fact, census data indicate the Detroit region is one of the most racially segregated areas in the country, including the Deep South. Most of the measures that we talk about were the African-American white segregation. So it was when you had three quarters to 80% of all African-Americans living within the city of Detroit, and you had all this expanse of suburbs with a very small percentage, um, it made Detroit the most segregated. Why is Detroit more deeply divided than other industrial cities? The shells of huge manufacturing centers remind us of the once plentiful jobs of the 30s and 40s. Blacks and whites moved here in droves. Factory work was easy to find, but housing was not. When homes were available, our government agencies often kept African Americans out. Federal policy beginning in the 1930s, it encouraged home ownership, but didn't make mortgages and loans available to African Americans. So blacks were forced to move to small sections of the city where they could rent rooms. The crowded 60 square block area known as Paradise Valley became home to thousands of blacks. Stores, other businesses, and clubs flourished. But much more housing was needed for black Detroiters. The Sojourner Truth Housing Project was built in 1942 near Seven Mile in Fenelon. Nearby white residents were enraged. They feared they would no longer be able to get loans for their property. When the first African Americans tried to move in, there was violence. As a result, the Housing Commission established a policy calling for the continuation of racial segregation in public housing. That brings us back to the wall. In the 20s and 30s, a few blacks who wanted to get away from Paradise Valley built wooden homes in this area. But a developer wanted to build nicer homes for white residents. The Federal Housing Administration would not give loans for racially mixed areas. So in 1940, up went the wall, nearly six feet high, one foot thick, and a half mile long. It kept us divided throughout the 40s. But in 1950, Burdette Rochelle became one of the first blacks to buy a house on the west side of the wall. Even then, options were limited. No, you couldn't buy a house in the place you wanted to. Danger often met blacks who tried to buy in an all-white neighborhood. In Detroit, um, between World War II and the mid-1960s, there were more than 200 attacks on the first or second African Americans to move into formerly white neighborhoods. And all of those played a role in hardening the racial divisions that still uh, persist in the metropolitan area. In the early 60s, P.T. Cochran and his wife Ruth were looking for a new home. He saw a house he liked here on Steel Street. Real estate agents had steered him away from the all-white neighborhood. But this home was for sale by owner. And I went in to talk to the owner and uh, engaged in the transaction, and we eventually we purchased it. Within days, for sale signs began to appear up and down this block. They began to move out when I moved there in 62. Cochran says he didn't take it personally. I, I hated to see uh, that kind of transition, but I didn't let it disturb me because, you know, you gotta live your life. But the former Tuskegee Airman was also the first black real estate appraiser for the city of Detroit. He knew white flight was costing him money. You have a move out, many move out 
and sell below the market because they want to get out, you know. In July 1967, events on 12th Street would accelerate the white flight from the entire city. Go home, white. Go home, white. This time, it was personal. So they had guns pointed, you know, and looking. But anyway, we made it all right. <clears throat> Our city and its residents still bear the scars. And we've learned walls aren't always made of cement.